Hello, welcome to episode seven of Open Educator. We have an exciting program and guest today. In this episode, we'll be talking to Dr. Walter Balzer, a blue flame thinker, someone who's been to the future and now will be sharing it with us, a uh, professor in the, at USF in the Bishop Center of, of Leadership and Ethics, uh, an entrepreneur himself, former director and founder of the Open Partnership Education Network. And before we beginning, uh, begin with our, our guests, I'd like to suggest that the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program kind of focuses on three main areas for the students. One, of course, the traditional view of thinking of entrepreneurship or entrepreneurs, the idea that an individual can create their own business. And there's no shortage of entrepreneurs and innovators here in the Tampa Bay community, alum, walk down central, walk down downtown Tampa, you will see businesses lined from alumni from the, this program. The second path is the idea of innovators or entrepreneurs within a company. And there are people that have to create new products and services and business models for businesses. We can think of Amazon, Apple, right? Who's thinking of this flying car taxi that's gonna be starting to build in Orlando and be a regional, regional hub? Well, there are people who have to do that within organizations. So we prepare students to become creatives, innovators, and entrepreneurs, even within a firm. And then lastly, we develop in individuals who create their own paths or define their own careers, not careers that others define for them, which other majors traditionally do. And we saw that last week with an alum coming to visit and share her experience of how Amelia had created her own path, driving a Bluebird bus and converting that into a tiny home, paving her path in Knoxville, working for a company, and then having a short and medium term plan to create and unlock value with her businesses, her ideas, and, and grow, personal growth. So those are the three main paths that we develop here within the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program. And I'm excited to have Walter, our guest, uh, to share a bit about his area of expertise and this unique intersection of openness, organizations, orientations, and this idea of the role of the hacker and what we can learn from hackers. And I would suggest that not only do we teach some of the skills of being a hacker here in the entrepreneurship innovation program, but also how to be a hustler and how to be a hipster. So with that, let's give Walter Balzer a big round of applause. And thank you for being with us and sharing your uh, time on the, uh, the best place to be on a Tuesday morning. So yeah. Walter, where does this cast find you? And maybe you can get us up to speed on what you've been working on or laying the foundation. Sure, Dr. Yasso, thanks so much for inviting me. And I'm really excited to meet with your group. And, uh, you know, I, uh, years ago, uh, Dr. Diasio and I met when I was uh, charged with starting a, a startup in St. Petersburg. I want to kind of tell you a quick story about that. Um, and then uh, just kind of like take you through this journey that has really just uh, accelerated, but in many ways, it's not really accelerated. It's just become more apparent. The, the current pandemic, the current situation has only made things more demonstrative to the kind of ideas that Steve and I were talking about years ago, uh, and especially with technologists. And so I just kind of want to take you through the journey, tell you a little bit about this, but I want to prepare you uh, for the fact that uh, we're going to be looking at this from a theoretical standpoint and a practical standpoint. So it's practice and theory and really understanding. So prepare yourself to, to think about constructs, to think about uh, theory a little bit. Um, and I know uh, we're up to that. So I want to share real quick, just kind of uh, uh, quick visuals. I'm a visual thinker, so I just want to kind of share um, some. Can you guys see this uh, presentation real quick here? Yeah. Uh, yes. Cool, cool. So, uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, I'm a uh, adjunct instructor with the Bishop Center for Ethical Leadership, and in this work, um, I teach currently right now. This quarter, I teach a course uh, in leading teams in diverse groups, and we start the entire course with a deep understanding of the changing paradigm. What is happening in the world? What is what do we mean by paradigm? And I want to kind of, that's really our discussion today, very briefly, and just kind of uh, hear from you guys, what are you experiencing? 
But to give you a background real quick, I, I was a teacher for years. I was a history teacher, taught all over uh, from, from Florida to New York City uh, and years, and I became a school administrator. And it was in that, you know, about 10 years ago where I realized, man, we are viewing things so myopically and in these little bubbles and silos. And nowhere was that more apparent than education. We just constantly talk about education or schools. But what I was seeing was, man, this is absolutely not about education or schools. Leading in an urban school, you really see the, the fibers that connect, the networks. And we were not approaching challenges and, and problems in society from a network perspective. And so I kind of went into scholarship and went in this direction and began researching and understanding how networks operate. I always worked in the technology space as a portal developer, always doing startups, torturing myself with, you know, all the way back in 99 when I was at Ohio State, uh, starting a startup. Um, it's going to be like a education. And it was, and, and just, I, I followed that journey for years and years. And I would say that I'm, I'm so blessed that I did torture myself in that way because the technology skills and the networks and working with developers over those years, it's never stopped paying back. And regardless of what I'm building or thinking about, there's a technology intersection. So today that's accelerated. Um, about four years ago, I was uh, hired by the University of South Florida to build a new program that would connect community learning. And it was totally open-ended, uh, no pun intended. There was no brand at that point. Um, it was like charged with, hey, create something that connects learning in the community, which is like awesome. That's like the perfect fuzzy like uh, charge. I got to know the investor, Jim Oresti, who is a really brave investor who, and when I say that, is someone who was like, this is what I want. What are your ideas? Uh, and I, he, he wanted kind of an Aspen Institute in St. Pete. And I was like, great. If you're going to do this today, you need to do this open source and you need to do this in a way that is non-institutional, that it's everybody can be in, involved. And that was coming from my research and my thinking that, you know, we we have to get outside of institutional mindsets. And I, I, that could be a whole nother discussion, but we're going to touch on that today. What do we mean by that? Um, and this is kind of the work that uh, Steve and I are working on. So anyway, long story short, I was hired to do this and I created this program or we created this program in the community called Open, the Open Partnership Education Network. Uh, and you can check it out at learnopen.org. But basically, it's kind of like an open source TED. How do you create a system that is, you know, not only creating engaging, thoughtful conversations in the community, but then actionable ideas that can come from it? Think of it like TED, but, you know, TED, you get a talk and it's not really localized. There's no context that maybe applies to your immediate world. If you talk about urban agriculture, that's awesome. But is that nuanced for your own community, for your own city? Those are the things that Open is trying to solve. So I started the program and then I passed it on and went out to the University of Denver. But I'm grateful that I'm actually taking it back over. So we are uh, launching it as an independent enterprise for all you entrepreneurs out there. Keep hustling, keep working, keep putting ideas out there, keep making those networks and connections because right is might and the ideas will eventually manifest into what, uh, what it's supposed to do. And Open Today is launching as an independent enterprise. And we're going to be rebooting in the next month or two. Uh, another startup that I just recently did is a uh, radschools.org, which is a forward thinking collaborative lab so that we can move education organizations like schools forward. So this is the kind of the things that I've been working on. And underlying all of that is this paradigm view that we have to change the way we operate as cities, as organizations, uh, the way that we work as teams, and that underlies the work that I do as an instructor, as a scholar, uh, the work that Steve and I do when we're uh, pushing ideas forward. But for you guys, for the entrepreneurs, this underlies how I believe we need to structure organizations. And so I want to kind of give you a quick overview of that and talk about this. So I think the best way to view this is from a paradigm view. And let me just lay that out by saying we need to, I believe, view things from a couple of lenses. Centralized, decentralized, and distributed. What do we mean by that? 
All right, so here, let me give you a quick overview. And going from left to right, what I would say is we have been sort of evolving from this left side to this right side. Uh, and I say evolving like that because the right side is actually the natural disposition of humans and organizations. If, if we were to go back to how we survived, we were doing it through distributed systems. But check this out. So let's view it from a centralized standpoint. Let's look at it as an institution. We had years ago, decades ago, a common school. It was in your community, whatever it is, a common curriculum. We could all agree that this is what we needed to learn. There was a bank or there was a store. These things were relatively centralized. If you grew up even in my generation, things were relatively central points for pretty much all of these functions in society. Over the last 20, 30 years, things are decentralizing, but we can still trace that back to a common node, to a common central point. But now it's many schools and agencies. Again, it's decentralized, but we can still trace it back to the state. That's what you should learn. The state of Florida, the state of the United States, whatever it may be, the county. So it's centralized, but decentralized. Uh, let's look at it. There's banks and apps, Venmo or whatever or online shopping, or Alibaba even, very decentralized. So we could say that those are all decentralized. So if that's where we've kind of been, what the hell's on the right side? What is distributed? Because this is what I would tell all of the entrepreneurs right now is prepare for this, but we're here. What does this mean for managing our teams? So what this means is we are now moving into an individualized distributed system. So Many schools and agencies, guys, we're seeing this. And this is what I mean by the pandemic's kind of accelerated it. But my daughter's in the other room right now doing this. OK, but all of you are doing this all the time. On, I mean, I put my little headphone in at night and I just listen to YouTube or whatever. We are self-learning. And so this is a paradigm shift that that is going to require um, a shift in how we manage our teams and so forth. Uh, crypto, so you could take a Venmo app and say, hey, man, I'm going to send you some money. That's actually a decentralized app. Crypto is going to be, you don't even need your bank. You can literally just send not money, but value across the uh, landscape. And then if you look at it from a standpoint of, uh, sorry, it's jammed up here. If you look at it from a standpoint of buying things, uh, maybe it's urban agriculture. Maybe it's uh, how you make something. We are slowly dissolving the institutional uh, processes and the institutions themselves from the way we operate as teams. And so I want to just let you let that sit in for a second. And then I want to ask you a few questions and leave this open for a minute. And how has this pandemic accelerated this shift to the distributed systems? I want you to think about these few questions and you can just jump in on any one of these three questions. Any of the so I'll leave that open and then ten minutes. Go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. So I would like to encourage uh, the audience and the students to think about how their life has changed in terms of our classes or in terms of how you're engaging with others. Uh, several of the students have businesses. How have you adapted? Because I think that speaks to some of this. These questions, if not all of these questions. I think the um, I'm going. I think the you know first thing that sticks out is just like how like most of everyone's classes are just like online now, um, and just to how that like you know I don't see that really going away necessarily and going back to full transition back to everybody going back to you know in class for the most part, and um, yeah I think it's really going to make school um, or higher education specifically more uh, accessible to more non traditional students like we're talking about in one of our classes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So access for sure. So let me um, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was gonna say, so this isn't necessarily a question, but I was actually so I was talking to my dad about this. Um, so since because like everything is pretty much remote now, um, 
it kind of makes me think about how if it is going to be permanent for now because a problem that my dad said he was having at work was maintaining like uh connections with people and networking uh so like whenever he has like meetings at work he does them remotely but um he's definitely like said it's hard for him to like develop stronger connections if it's like all online yeah which is something i've definitely thought about with uh like how like just this change certainly does you, definitely make steve is that you no it's me spencer sorry hey spencer sorry i can't see the screen i i, I can only see the powerpoint apologize so i'm curious to know from the student's perspective while we're our courses are asynchronous aren't we still building bonds and connecting is it possible we even have a closer connection because we're making the effort every week to meet that's not a requirement or some sort of 15 week schedule two days a week an hour and a half of listening to me talk but in fact we're sharing where isn't this a, a, an alternative or possibly one step in creating that human connection or connecting with people or building those bonds and relationships has anyone felt that or view this I as i think it's more efficient and uh like it's easier to meet with people but i don't feel like the at least me personally i feel like the interactions and like the bond isn't as strong whereas if i was to meet someone in person yeah so here's a here's a question yeah, especially for uh, the, uh, I think Spencer, who, who your dad is trying to adjust to this organizationally. I really want to think about these last two questions. Um, how does this mark a permanent shift in human and organizational behavior? And how does this relate to leading teams or organizations? So are we now in a stage where this is the natural environment that we live in? We live in a uh, virtual or um, sort of fluid environment physically we're able to move we're able to do things like that so as team leaders or, or entrepreneurs starting an organization do you now have to adjust to this permanent shift or is it can you bend it back to these personal in-person behaviors what's real what's not real mm -hmm. i think uh currently it's like adapting i think people have to adapt to like the situation like we are now, like having doing everything remotely and uh, using Teams and everything. But I do feel like, at least I hope, as like technology uh, progresses and um, because we're like, like you said, we're shifting, having like a permanent shift in this uh, behavior that it will begin to innovate and make it more personal and come up with ways to make it more, uh, like more human, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, how Graham was saying like, um that it's becoming less less personal, less bonding between like people in an organization. I think it's going to be, um, how do I say this? Oh man, I lost it. I lost it. <laughs> I feel I I think I'll I know. Back. It's going to be maybe a little bit more independent, or like it's yeah. like more independent workloads. Okay. Yep. That's where I was going with it. Cool. One of the things I, going along with that too, I think um, that's going to happen is, you know, we're kind of, if we're going to go with the assumption that this is, you know, I think the new normal or whatever you want to say, this is like how we're going to go about doing things, you know, more in the future. Um, we're just like at the very beginning of it. And, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of creation. So I first see, you know, with work and school and things like that, you know, VR and augmented reality becoming, you know, really big in these sectors. And um, to where we can kind of fill some of those gaps to where, you know, we can not necessarily be physically, you know, in the same space, but we could physically be in the same virtual space. And it could be a little bit more like personal. I think we'll see that more and more um, as we go on. I also do think um, it'd be interesting to see how like technology would adapt to this. Because I think the reason it's not as personal is because I feel like it's, it's like things that happen in your subconscious and, um, like 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 physiological things like when you're meeting person like a person like eye contact i feel like it's hard i mean 
you can get kind of eye, eye, contact, oh, eye contact over um, teams. But then it's like, I feel like to make a true bond, there's like things like it's multi-sensory experience. So like touch, like feel, smell, like everything that you associate when you're meeting a person, like shaking their hand. I feel like it's hard to like emulate that online. So I think it'd be interesting to see how uh, that will change <laughs> or how people will like innovate that to make these interactions more meaningful. Graham, you bring up a clutch term there, which is subconscious. And uh, that's actually a term that Steve and I use in a paper we wrote. Um, and what, what I hear in this conversation is, we break this down in my in my team's course into two kinds of changes and th this is part of change management there are mm -hmm. adaptive changes and then there are technical changes so the technical changes are the tools we use the, and that's what we're seeing a lot of we're seeing a lot of technical changes which is we're going to virtual we could do augmented reality we we have to evolve on the technical we all agree that but what we're really going to have to adjust to is the adaptive challenges, the adaptive change that's happening. Yeah. That is the subconscious. That is an example is, do we actually trust each other to do work outside of supervision? Those are the adaptive changes that we need to be thinking about now as yeah. entrepreneurs and team leaders. And if we don't, then these are more adaptive questions. If we do trust, great. Then we need technical things to maybe uh, keep track. Uh, but if we don't, then how's that going to play out? How's that going to play out with employees and, and entrepreneurs and creators who are used to working in a very freelance environment now? Those are all adaptive questions that we're just scratching the surface of. I know. That. Honestly, a big example that even just for us as students, I would say is um, Proctorio. Is that like I, I feel like the it's not I feel like it's not only like trusting people, but honestly, the software itself and like the technology, because I feel like that's like the biggest problem people have with Proctorio is it's like uh, one is pretty intrusive uh, people feel. But um, also it's. It's like um, I do agree, it's kind of hard to emulate trust online, whereas like in person where you can really just go check on someone like in the office or something and see like, hey, you get this done or whatever. I think you can do that with like things like Slack and Discord, yeah. but uh, it's not like a hundred percent yet. It could get there. I'd like to see how, uh, how that works out. Yeah, that, and that, that gets us to uh, the deeper questions that we have to look at. And I, I'm glad you brought these subconscious uh, questions up because this is what we talk about in my courses and even in the scholarship Steve and I are talking about it's really about energy so let's go even deeper on the theoretical level in the centralized space so in a centralized world meaning let's think back 50 years ago you worked at IBM or you worked at some major company there's a central point of information and control or think about news think about truth right there's a truth and so Walter Cronkite, every night, that was the truth. That's what came out. Or the, the you know, uh, president uh, of the company decided this is what we're doing. Or it's relatively centralized. In a decentralized space, there's nodes of information and control, and they tend to come from the center. And then there's multiple truths. And we can, we can handle that. We can kind of handle that. And then think about it from a business organization standpoint it could be multiple departments and there's the mac department and then there's the ipad and you know, you know those handheld department and they can kind of compete and there are multiple truths and this is how we should design and yeah, that's kind of manageable in a distributed world this is where it gets really crazy and we're seeing it in media we're seeing it in technology uh, Jack Dorsey from Twitter is right now talking in, in front of Senate dealing with this. Now you have nodes of information and control connected to each other. And well, you could say that there are basically, is it infinite truths? Or at that point, it just becomes no truths. And uh, I'll mention quick on Twitter, Jack Dorsey is actually creating a completely different Twitter right now. 
He's launched a decentralized app bounty so that DAP developers can create a distributed Twitter because he realizes that it is unmanageable. This is what you're dealing with now from a theoretical standpoint and a real practical standpoint. Now let's bring this down to your organization. So there, from an organization standpoint, you're dealing with this right side. And the bigger your company scales and the bigger your uh, ambitions are, the more this is going to look like the right side. So you have a team, you're managing them, they have ideas, they think design should look this way, they think their workday should look this way, they think that uh, vacation time should look this way, and you are going to have to deal with that. And so the question is, what do you do? How do you create a team, a business, a scalable enterprise that's going to deal with that? And I'll just kind of finish up by saying this is the kind of stuff that Steve and I are looking at. If you look at Google, Google's doing this right now. Little by little, they're stripping away institutional constructs that define at a centralized level what people should do. They realize that this on the right side is, is the reality. And the pandemic is only bringing it into the fold. So where everybody can see it. So they just got rid of all hands on deck meetings that they used to have because they realized that's a centralized or at best a decentralized approach. People will know when they want to get together, they're going to get together. It's in a distributed world. From In my course, we look at it from nature. If you try to tell root systems what to do, if you try to do this with fertilizers, you may get a lot of yield, but you're not going to get sustainability. That root system on the left-hand side is what you want. And we could go for decades looking at Monsanto, looking at uh, art artificial growing mechanisms. Those are no longer sustainable. We realize that we need to create root systems that find each other. The fibers will find a way. Nature is the perfect way to emulate your business. So looking at it from a theoretical standpoint, what can we do? Take a look at this graph on the right side. Steve and I are just getting started on this, but we are looking at orientations. We're saying, our Graham, if Spencer, we're saying if you guys want to lead, uh, lead institutions or businesses that are going to thrive in this next uh, distributed era, you need to be skewing to the right. You need to be checking yourself. Am I thinking about this left or am I thinking about this right? Where do I land in this orientation continuum? Uh, and then look at the people around you. Look at the people that lead you. Where are they on this continuum? We argue that we need to be skewing more toward the right, the open orientations, the open educator, the open innovator. What does that look like? It manifests differently in different contexts. But we think that these values, the emphasis you should be placing on how you do business and the principles should be skewing toward the right. I'll stop there for a second and just any thoughts on that. Um, and, and I'll just kind of wrap up. I, this is a basic starting point for us. For the students, I hope you start seeing connection, especially for those who are in the scalability class where we set paradigms, particularly in how cor corporate innovation has changed and evolved over history, st uh, specifically starting with closed innovation or this very centralized unit, very specific group of people to this more open paradigm or this open innovation approach that companies now are adopting to reduce risk, to reduce costs, to collaborate, to accelerate products to the market. So in that world, hopefully you can see some overlay or some practice of how this open orientation is happening in one segment of a, you know, a much bigger field. And Steve, I would say every one of those points on the right hand side or every row is literally a week in a course. We could talk about inductive versus inductive thinking just for a whole week and understanding how do we become more inductive thinkers? What does that mean? Or how do we create a peer based versus an institution based uh, system in our in our startup. How do we create uh, a um, you know a, a mindset around the market versus the firm? You know, 
every one of these takes growth. I would also like to highlight, think about how you experience the courses. I can't speak for the other ones, but the ones that you have with me. Why are we constantly posting our work so other students and other peers can review it? For a few things. One, uh, you have to have clarity in how you're communicating the others. But two, every person has to review that work or there's people who have to respond to it if it's me or a peer or a colleague who's giving you feedback and then they provide feedback on top of it. So here's a form of way that you're connecting with a peer and they're providing an alternative view, alternative perspective instead of just the sage on the stage or some institutional member giving whatever they believe is correct or truth. So maybe we're start, starting to see that even in our coursework and that's how I've embedded it or how it's evolved in my courses. Same thing with the creativity and innovation course, right? There's why when we have one long thread and there's 120 students and each person is expected to do a video and reply to a video, now we have this very different approach to learning and and sharing. No, actually, I do really actually like it. Um, I, I think honestly, one of the biggest things I take advantage of with how you said how we have, like we share our work and like the discussions and stuff. I wouldn't, it's not copying, but I would say it's like kind of like how we talk about like uh, innovation, like how you kind of like build upon other people's ideas. I think by like having each other share your work, it kind of like, at least for me, it helps like it gives me ideas on one like, I don't know, like how to structure my uh, my projects or like things I might have forgot about, um, things I could add or things I could even improve that someone included like a like a uh, a tool that someone included in their thing, how I could use that in mind but improve upon it. I think it's like a, it definitely helps me create like higher quality work than if I was just to be on my own and just like read off a rubric or something. Absolutely. Absolutely. Graham, what you just brought up there is I could take two or three of these rows that kind of blend into that, but I just want to land on the deductive versus inductive. So what you just described is sort of a shared and an inductive uh, and a peers. I mean, you went right down the right side. So, and Steve and I have faced this uh, in most institutions, let's say a university, as an example, you are, uh, and I want to just say that the word orientation, a way to describe that is it's your instincts. All right. It's like what you naturally uh, skew toward. And it's based on who you are, what you, how you grew up, what, what organizational structures have you been a part of? Um, so we tend to skew in a university toward deductive thinking, meaning what does that look like? Well, we need a strategic plan. Let's, uh, stick to the strategic plan. This the, the plan. We know what we should do in three years. We should X, Y, and Z. We will be X, Y, and Z in three years. And the plan will tell us how to do that. That's deductive thinking. And what we're saying is, well, you know, let's do some guidelines and keep it a little bit open ended because we just don't know. That is a really uncomfortable place for people. All right. So inductive thinking, the idea that you get more people around this and then it starts to evolve naturally. Man, that is super hard for. To yeah, it's like a cosmic core, like the fear of the unknown. <laughs> Absolutely. So it takes work and it's based on context, you know. I would like to also suggest that a lot of our organizations and institutions, if you remember taking the principles of management class with me or with other faculty members, a lot of these closed or uh, orientations on, on the left side, you know, we have evolved institutions through the mindset and the experiences of the military. A lot of our concepts and understanding of broadly management of broadly organization stem after World War II when we understood or utilized different concepts to win the war. And that bled into organizational analysis, organizational structure, how we believe uh, an institution should work. And while that may have helped in some ways, it may ha have limitations to changing paradigms, changing trends, changing environments. Um, and now we're seeing these instead of the manager 
you know, how do we build trust within this distributed paradigm within an organization or within several organizations? And you may not even work for an organization in the future, but how do you trust people or work with people opposed to this command and control view, which is very common in the military and was very common and still very common in most organizations, right? You are accountable for doing this job nine to five, punching in, punching out, doing this on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. And here are your deliverables. And I'm going to tell you how to do it. Yeah. yeah. And Steve, I'd take it even more matter than the, and the military is a great example, but it's dominant structures, right? Dominant sectors. And how have those dominant sectors played out in the way we run organizations and teams. And as entrepreneurs, I think that the thing I just want to drive home is you are going to have to manage teams. And the more talent you have, the more talented the individuals are, will put all my money on it, the more they're going to want flexibility, the more they're going to want to be operating in the natural environment that is distributed. And so your systems will need to emulate that natural environment, that root system that we had on the left hand side. And I think that's what you see from smart corporations like Google or any of these companies that are getting it. They understand it. You know, when Facebook says we're going permanently to distributed workspace, well, they understand that that's the natural world. You're not bringing that back. There's no amount of Monsanto you can spray on that that's going to work, you know. So. Those are the kind of things that we look at. And I'll just leave this piece with orientations being a check, a self check. If I was going into a school or I was going into a, a bank or an organization and saying, hey, you really want to be more prepared for the distributed world? You really want to build an open source org? Awesome. You need to keep checking yourself on these because everything you do as a leader. If it's focused on more accountability, even your verbiage, your discourse, if you're out there saying, hey, we want to be, we want to make sure that we're going to come around to all the classrooms and we're going to, this is literally word for word from the new super that came into Hillsborough. He's like, I want to make sure that everybody's teaching like their hair's on fire. Yeah, that sounds great. That's super, super left on, on this continuum. You know, I want to hear more verbiage and discourse around trust. I want to hear more around fluid networks. Those are the kind of principles that should underlie how you run the organization. And so real quick, where do we see this already happening? Where do we find inspiration? I've been looking for the last few years at how hackers do this. Hackers are badasses at all of that on the right hand side. I've been out to Hackathon, especially at ETH Denver, the Ethereum conference there. and I've been very close to the ETH community or really just just observing and understanding how this decentralized app developers especially work in an extremely inductive ecosystem. I mean, if you walk into a team and, and anyone can join a team practically, it's super inclusive. But if you walk in and you're like, ah, oh, this is what the app should look like when we're done. Uh, after these three days, you're going to get chased out of there. That's not inductive thinking. It starts in a very organic process. Let's get the fuzziest possible ideas of what we want. And then they have a test net where they can create that app and then test it, get it out there. And they don't give a shit if it works or not. It's the idea. So what are the principles that we can take from this culture? of sharing, of, of building upon each other's ideas. Then they take that, put it on GitHub where someone can run with it later on. Some ideas grow. If we go back to this, I mean, you look at it, it's like some of it is, it's about process. It's not about the product. It's iterating, not replicating. If I had a dollar for every time I heard, we need to do what this school did or we need to do what this organization did, that's replication talk. We need to talk iteration. What What is your version? That's a 0.6. Yours is going to be a completely different one based on context. So I think hackers are a great place to look for inspiration and to see. And I'll just kind of close with this. Things that we have to consider is how are we going to flourish in this environment? It's not going backwards. We have to figure out a way to connect that energy and become comfortable 
with terms like fuzzy. And I just don't know. You know, this is my best thinking, not best practices, best thinking. That is it. That's all you can do. We talk a lot in my classes around language. What is the language that we use? You watch Elon Musk. His language is littered with failure, permission to fail. How do you how do you create that ecosystem in, in your organization? And then the book I would recommend, man, is Here Comes Everybody by Clay Shirky. He was way ahead of his time. This is like 10 years ago. But he's essentially he's out of NYU and he nails it. We've we've got communication and coordination covered. And so if you're running your team and you're trying to figure out how to make your Asana better or your ClickUp even better and then, you know, like sending out a weekly email, that's all good. But, man, we got that covered. All right. We can slack. We can do it's cooperation. That's where we're, our growth area is. So as Shirky notes in this book, coordination and communication costs have dropped to zero. We used to have a school because that was a time we knew we could start school at a certain time. We used to have the nine to five work hour because that helped us organize a million other things. Those things are no longer necessary. We can coordinate and communicate in a distributed paradigm. We just don't know how to cooperate. We don't know how to build on each other's ideas. We don't know how to hear them. Those are the things that are short circuiting, you know. So I'll leave you with that, and uh, and I'll just leave it open there. Um, actually, do you think? I mean, it kind of. I feel like it kind of does, just the way you described it. But do you think by? I guess I would say like tackling like. A person's ego essentially like do you think people's egos has to do with this like not communicating and uh not being open mind not sharing like do you think the a per basically yeah do you think a person's ego has like an impact on innovation absolutely every i mean in our class we start with a self-assessment called indigo and it's a full in inside out and as the course continues, it's all about vulnerability. It's all about vulnerability. And whether you're talking about starting open, where the language that I try to use always is, you know, fuzzy, uh, this is my best thinking. Um, listen, uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, that's all ego, putting ego aside and acting like I, not acting, but being authentic. I, just, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think about a root system, right? I think about that deep root, you know, that little node, whatever it may be, it's like this insignificant plant that's a mangrove or whatever it's over here. It it's humble, man. It's humble, but it connects and it brings that energy back into the ecosystem in its own time. And it connects to that fiber underneath the soil and if we as leaders can create that vulnerability to be that node, to be that piece that is not always the center, that's going to create that energy. All right, cool. If you could maybe close the PowerPoint and then we can have a, a few questions and thoughts, I guess. So we, we've broken this down in terms of orientations and we've given some ideas that we can get inspiration from hackers. What can we as students, future leaders, future one of many nodes, but people who want to craft our own careers, craft our own paths, what can we do now or are there skills or some small tasks that we can take away and say, you know, if you want to excel, lead, change, and compete in this paradigm, what can we do now to, to be three, four, five, six steps ahead of those who don't even know that this is happening or are working in this old paradigm? Any thoughts on that, Walter? What can we do? Man, I'd love to hear any anybody got a take on that because you know, there's there's a few things I could think of. Anybody got a take? I don't mean to interrupt. I have to run to a dentist appointment in 10 minutes. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Great talk. And uh, thanks, Professor. Thanks, man. 
I'll tell you uh, what we focus on is, and, and this is getting back to like technical versus adaptive, but one thing that I think cuts right down the middle, because there's a sense of urgency that we have to get to this. And we, we need some technical tools, right? But the adaptive is, it's going to take a generation, right? Um, but one thing that cuts right through is language. Language. Just look at the discourse. Look at the, the not just physical language, but body language, all right? Look at the, the things you say. Go back to that orientations chart, right? Or we, we have a, uh, I created a language um, discourse guide in the education space as an example for, for school leaders. Um, and you could do that for every organization. And you look at the words that you choose and say, okay, are these moving us in the open direction? Are they, are they more deductive and so forth? That's a really easy one to really start training yourself to tune your orientation. And then that relates to the vulnerability piece that Graham brought up. If you start tuning yourself to be more, uh, you know, vulnerable, and creating that environment in your systems. And one way to do that is to create low risk situations for your team to fail, you know, for your, for your thought leaders in the organization and your team, they have ideas, they may suck. You are the leader, you have the vision, you know what this needs to look like, but those ideas are truths. Those are truths that need to be heard. And so how can you create low risk situations where those ideas can, can come out and then that person on your team can reflect on that. Uh, if you think about Falcon 9 rocket before that thing went off, how many failures, how many, uh, how many different ways did they probably try that? And so I think language and then creating space for vulnerability, not just in yourself, but in, in your team, those are two practical things we can do. Um, honestly, do you think it would be like, a, so, so I would say since like, I don't know, like people were like as humans we're just like pretty tribalistic pretty social like animals and uh i feel like people tend to look up to leadership and like authority figures you think by simply just being a leader and then they just like just start throwing out ideas even like per even sometimes purposely throwing out bad ones do you think that simply would be enough to get people to start collaborating and throwing out their own ideas Great question. It, and that's why I show that picture about, and we have a whole couple weeks on it. We actually go to a community garden, uh, an urban farm, actually, Sweetwater in Tampa. Um, you have to build the soil. You have to build the soil. When I was doing my leadership training, um, we focused a lot in, the, in those years on a term that I love and I still hold true, and that's holding environment. What is your holding environment? And if that is your holding, holding environment. Okay, hold it. <laughs> that is it's your organization, it's your ethos, it's your, you know, if you're putting on an event, for example, conversation around culture or, you know, tough conversations, the, the issue sometimes is that we just throw these things out without fully building soil that allows that to be productive. So if you come in and fail miserably, but you haven't built that trust and you haven't built, it's not going to work, you know? And then that's where um, in our course, for example, we spent quite a bit of time talking about how to build that foundation. And we use that. Uh, we use the metaphor of the Castillets of Barcelona, the human towers that are built. And the human towers are amazing. And they're so profound that the teams that work together work together to the point where they will send a small child that's eight or nine years old to the top of that tower that's 10, 10 stories high. And that tower walk flexible enough to walk with thousands of people at the base and then a spine, and then they send a kid. That's how tr they're, they feel trust um, enough that they will send a nine-year-old kid to the top of that tower. But it's that foundation, you know? Mm -hmm. Wonderful uh, metaphor. I've seen those live when I lived in Barcelona. Impressive. And everyone who's not part of the the group, the Castellets, because there, there's many of them uh, across the region, you see the child climbing and you're holding your breath. Yeah. I, you know, of course, the, the, the individuals in the Castellet teams have their own 
you know, way of thinking, but they trust each other. And the child who's climbing those 10 stories or five, whatever it is, has trusting all those little pieces or those individuals who are making this giant structure. So fabulous. Uh, Walter, thank you very much. One last question I would like to pose to you. And since you've been to the future and you're here, but I'm wondering if you could go back and share some wisdom or advice for your younger self, what would you tell that, that younger Walter? Uh, what would you say to him? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, uh, you know what? Um, I just thank my mom for always being uh, a person who instilled in me the idea that, uh, that trust your gut, feel, you know, you know, what you think is what you think is the right direction. It, you know, and the, the more I've delved into this and or gone into the future and what I I think Steve's saying there is it's not me. It's when you see what technologists are doing or you see other cultures that are adapting to this, that's the future. You're like, wow, this needs to go mainstream. Um, that's it's energy. And if I could tell myself, you know, it's almost not doing something different because I followed that path. Thanks to my mom's wise words growing up. Um, she always, I think, had me in this right side of the orientations. And it is, I would tell my younger self, keep following energy, keep following energy. Those networks connect, all those fibers connect, the institutions, the, uh, the discourse of the day, all of those are going to get you to doubt, uh, but put it out there, put that out there because it always comes back and it's just like a metaphysical thing almost. And I would just tell myself, keep doing that. You know, keep putting that energy out there. Wonderful. Thank you for spending the morning with us, Walter. Let's hope that we have you back soon. Um, this has been insightful. We can start seeing how these paradigms are compared to what we're learning in class, what we need to be prepared for as we go forward in our careers or defining our own careers. But I can't thank you enough. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, guys. Uh, wonderful time today. So uh, anything I can. Uh, let's connect. Do you have a LinkedIn? Uh, I do. I have a LinkedIn and then uh, on Twitter it's uh, at W Balzer. Um, are you able to post